Hi, my name is Blue Jay Robinson. Here at Correlated Solutions, we're very proud of our patented High Speed Fast Fourier Transform, or FFT, module. Most simply, the High Speed FFT module provides the ability to transform time domain displacement and strain data into the frequency domain. It can be added onto any VIC 3D system and enables viewing, measurement, and analysis of full field 3D operational deflection shapes, or ODSs, which occur from transient events. The ODS analytical method can be used for visualizing the vibration patterns of a specimen under unknown loads. For example, civil engineers might find forces acting on their bridges come from waves, wind, or traffic. Automotive engineers may find these forces are due to starting up an engine, shutting it down, or operating it at a high velocity. And aeronautical engineers may find these forces come from thruster ignition, wing flap adjustment, or landing gears contact to the ground. The list goes on and on. You should know pretty quickly if this type of measurement analysis is useful for your applications. I have here a data set of a PC fan that was excited using a run-up test. I simply had the fan disconnected from the power source, then I acquired images of the fan as it became connected to the power source. I've already got a calibration of my project file and have my test images processed in the time domain, so now I'm able to process my data again to see what the ODSs look like in the frequency domain. This data set has 2,000 images that were captured at a rate of 6,400 frames per second. It took about 30 minutes to process the images on an i7 CPU, but having more cores means that you can process the data faster. We get to the Frequency Analysis dialog box by clicking this fancy F that some of you already may associate with the Fast Fourier Transform. We see here an image of our sample with the original ROI highlighted by a box. Your square area defines where our FFT analysis will be performed and can be adjusted based on your preference. We also see a bunch of boxes we can adjust, so I'll just go through each of these one by one. First, we can either enter our frame rate in hertz or our time step in milliseconds. This sets the frequency scale for our measurements. The sampling step defines our data density and is defined in terms of pixels. It has to be the same or larger than what we used in our original ROI. So if the same step is used as in the ROI, each ROI point will also have an FFT point. We will get data points where the green dots are, so more data points will require a little more memory and will take a little longer to process. If we use a step size half that of what we used in the original ROI, we'll get half as many points in both the X and Y directions. Next, we have the smoothing filter. This allows us to define the number of points around any given point to help smooth our data. This filter only considers FFT data points in the filter, so if you use a smaller step size, you may want a larger filter size. A smoothing filter of 1 means no smoothing will be applied to the data at all. We also have the ability to apply a window function to our data. While no window needs to be applied, the hand window generally produces greatly reduced aliasing, with the trade-off being a slightly decreased frequency resolution. And the Hamming window does a good job of canceling the nearest side lobes, but does a poor job of canceling any others. You may want to first run your data with no window, then go back and apply the best window for your application. You can choose to compute accelerations, which adds U double prime, V double prime, W double prime to your dataset. These are frequency normalized versions of the variables that can make it easier to spot peaks with small amplitudes at higher frequencies. To save data for future sessions, check the Save FFT data box. If this box is cleared, you will need to rerun the analysis to see the data again. If you save it with a new file name, it's a nice way to compare data that's been previously processed with different parameters. You can also select additional or fewer variables for the extraction. Selecting more variables will use more memory. The data files to be included are listed in the Data Files group box. You can choose to remove certain data files if you'd like. When you have the settings just the way you want them, click the Start button and the data will begin processing. Depending on your settings and the number of images, this can be a little time consuming. But after your data has been processed, we can check out our frequency workspace. In this case, I'm working with CAN data, so I won't process anything here, but I'll share the results of the data with you. OK, so we have a lot to cover here, but let's just start at the top. You'll see two tabs. In the Maxima tab on the left, the top left plot shows the maximum amplitude for the selected variable, and the top right plot shows for each point the frequency corresponding with this maximum amplitude. To select a different variable, you can right-click in either plot and select variable. Use the mouse wheel to zoom in on the plots and click drag to pan. You can also view these plots in 3D. Right-click and select show 3D plot. The amplitude is plotted as a contour on the 3D shape plot. 
You can also view the amplitude value as a 3D shape. Right click and select Z axis, contour variable. This shows the maximum amplitude as a shape. The bottom left plot shows the average amplitude versus frequency for the selected variable. Here, peaks are seen at 33 hertz, 69 hertz, 102 hertz, 121 hertz, 175 hertz, and 556 hertz. The bottom right plot shows the average value versus time for the selected variable. This is useful because it allows you to see if you caught all the ringing for your test, or if you caught too many of the images after the ringing is stopped. You can view detailed amplitude phase data for any given frequency by clicking the other tab, Amplitude Phase. In this tab, the top left plot shows the amplitude for the selected variables at the selected frequency. The top right plot shows the relative phase for the selected variable at the selected frequency. To change the displayed frequency, you have a few options. First, to make the peaks a bit easier to find, you can right click in the graph and change the X or Y axes to have a linear or logarithmic scale. Changing the Y to a logarithmic scale makes the peaks a bit easier to find. You can also right click in the plot to change your cursor to a crosshair. You can click and drag the small round marker at the top left of the average amplitude plot to any desired frequency. Or double click at the top of the graph to get to a location quickly. You can make your own clicks more accurate by shift clicking an area you want to zoom in on. This allows you to resize the window. Or you can just enter the value in the F equals spin box in the FFT tools toolbar. To get back to the original view, you can double click anywhere in the graph. So as you can see, the plots will change to reflect the data for any given frequency. Let's find a nice big peak to work with. To change the variable you want to view, right click in the plot and click variable. Here, we select the out-of-plane variable, W. To view the amplitude versus frequency and phase versus frequency plots for a given point, you can click the Add Point button, this blue circle here, in the FFT tools, and then click the Extraction Location, but you have to be in the 2D view to do this. Additional lines will appear on the graph below showing the amplitude and frequency for that point. You can also add line slice extractions to the plot, but to see the results, you'll need to toggle your graph to Show Line Slices. To remove extractions, click the Delete Point button in the FFT tools and then click on the point. The red square button allows you to specify a reference point, which will make that point's phase set the scale to zero. Click it, then click on the reference point location in the 2D plot. You'll see the lines in the phase graph at the lower right re-reference to this point. To export extracted or average amplitude and phase data, click the Export FFT Data button. You can select the desired points, variables, amplitude, and phase for points, as well as the average of all the data. Click OK to select a file name and create a CSV file. You can also save the plot animations as videos. This is really nice for presentations and reports. Finally, in the Color Map tab, you can adjust the color map, opacity, number of color levels, and number of level labels. In the Auto Scaling tab, you can make the data scale to sequence and choose to define the amplitude and phase ranges. Scale to sequence automatically sets the maximum and minimum values of the amplitude scale based on the values in the graph. So this kind of puts the amplitude of the current frequency into perspective. DIC measurements have been performed for many types of applications on many different samples. This technology excels at measuring ODSs on samples that rotate, that are high temperature, and that have large displacements or amplitudes during tests. A few samples we've measured are hot engine manifolds during a run-up event, a car door slam, wing flaps on aero structures, and turbine blades. There are many more applications that have been and will be measured with DIC in the future. Though 2020 was a tough year to work in, we made some significant developments that pushed this technology forward. One development was a new graphics engine and user interface within the DIC software called IRIS. This brought a whole new host of functionality from the DIC software. For example, some features not previously available are the capability to import finite element data for visualization and comparison to measurement data, and the capability to display synchronized analog data values alongside extractions and contour plots. DIC does have a sample preparation requirement in that a random, high contrast, non-reflective speckle pattern must be applied to the sample surface. While there are many types of patterns that don't work, we've made it very easy to apply a pattern that works great. Not only have we created an entire kit to help apply the pattern, we're on version 2.0 of the kit, 
which applies an ideal dot pattern more evenly and consistently across the surface of your sample. The capabilities of using DIC to measure ODSs are only going to grow in the future. Soon, users will be able to import ODSs from Vic3D into the Iris Graphics Engine to utilize the increased functionality currently available for strain and deformation data. This will make it much more efficient to work with huge amounts of data from ODS projects. As I hope I've demonstrated, it is the flexibility and quality of our system which gives unparalleled results that many industry-leading testing and research facilities have already discovered. If you have any questions about what I've done here or about how we can help improve your testing regimen, please don't hesitate to reach out to us in the comment section below or by email or phone. We look forward to hearing from you soon.